want to thank the university for inviting me and for Louise and Claudia for the many uh, email exchanges we had to get things organized, and where would we be without email? I'll talk about that. <laughs> so um, <laughs> there was a time before email, and uh, uh, so it's been, uh, everything's been fine. I had a wonderful, uh, safe travel here, and the hotel's wonderful, so uh, uh, it is a little bit interesting to be talking about history in a, in a uh, course about the future of computing, but I hope to so make some connections. And uh, uh, also, one other thing I want to mention is that if you at any point have questions, feel free to interrupt. Uh, I, I'm very casual about that. So um, I guess we'll start by saying, well, where do, you, where do you begin? And it's a very difficult subject. It's extremely hard to, to do this history um, because the history of computing is as old as Homo sapiens, that counting and keeping track of, of quantities and manipulating numbers is, is ancient. And to start the history of computing with the ancient world would not, would not only last all week, but all month or, or longer. And I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I obviously can't do that. So I have to figure out where do you begin. I'll, I'll telegraph one of my future slides. I'm going to begin in the 1940s. But before I get there, I want to cover some things because I know if you go to Wikipedia or if you go, go to a bookstore and look at any of the no, number, uh, numerous histories of computing that are out there, they're all going to mention other things before 1940s. And you're going to say, well, how come, uh, Dr. Ceruzzi, how come you didn't mention the Antithecara mechanism? This was a, uh, rec uh, a relic found uh, by a Greek fisherman about 100 years ago. It was x-rayed in the 1970s, and uh, recently, much more sophisticated um, tests were done on it. And it's uh, very clear that it was an astronomical calculator that could predict uh, the, the heavens' uh, staggering complexity of mechanical engineering that seems to have vanished uh, until, the, uh, until the late Middle Ages, until the Industrial Revolution. So what, people are still uh, baffled Although they figured out what it did, they're really baffled about how did the Greeks have this kind of technology. Well, I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> uh, this is a whole subject worthy of a talk in itself. So um, other books that you probably have read or heard is they always start with the abacus. And the abacus is indeed a way of keeping track of quantities. The, uh, this particular illustration is interesting because they're on a board. Notice the... Hindu Arabic numerals, which was a, 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 a tremendous innovation coming across from the Arab world. Notice that they're on a board which is called a counter. Now, in the United States, we call stock trades over-the-counter trades. I don't know whether that's true in Europe or not, but that's what we call it. And we also, on a kitchen, when you prepare your food, you prepare it on a kitchen counter. It's a table. And that's what they're doing. They're counting quantities on a table with an abacus, with the help of an abacus and with the help of Hindu Arabic numbers. So I'm not going to talk about that either. <laughs> um, this is another interesting early uh, jetons. These are the, from the 14th century. If you go to uh, gamble in uh, Monte Carlo, and I hope you don't because you're all mathematics majors <laughs> and you know that you don't win, but uh, in the United States we go to Las Vegas and you use poker chips. So the, these are quite old as well. Uh, I didn't mention a slide here, but uh, people keep track of prayers with rosary beads. And it turns out the Inca Indians in uh, South America had uh, a very elaborate system of knotted strings to keep track of quantity. So these are all things that uh, you could begin the history of computing with. But when you get a little bit closer to the 1940s, we come up with this, these two machines, actually, which have recently been very much in the news, primarily because they've been rebuilt. They were uh, code-breaking machines uh, built during the Second World War by the British at a place called Bletchley Park to uh, decrypt coded messages that were coded on the Enigma. This was a cipher machine that was widely sold, commercialized in Europe, and used by many countries the Germans uh, added some sophistication to it. They believed it was unbreakable. Uh, the British, in a sense, they, they built a kind of reverse engineering enigma. In other words, they built this machine to run backwards, mechanical, 
And uh, a lot of the genius of it was uh, due to a man named Alan Turing, whom I'll get to in a minute. Um, <clears throat> there was another, uh, and by the way, this became uh, the subject of a Hollywood movie called The Imitation Game. I don't know whether that's been popular in, the, in the, uh, Europe or not, but it has a lot of Hollywood creative license about it. But uh, actually, a lot of these were built, and it did work. And uh, uh, the, there was another machine, though. This is the one that I'm more interested in. This was an electronic device, and it was designed, if you could say this was an Enigma running in reverse, you could say this was a special purpose electronic computer that was programmed to sift through all the possibilities of code. And uh, we heard the lectures this morning about supercomputers. This is one of the major applications of supercomputers today, uh, decrypting coded messages. Uh, it's, it's obviously very top secret. If you go to the Top 500 website, and I urge you all to do that, top 500.org, you'll see the list of all these computers, many of them in China, uh, in Switzerland, in the, in the United States. And some of them, they say Oak Ridge National Laboratory or Swiss something, you know. Some of them just say U.S. government. Those are the ones that do the code breaking. So, uh, at least as far as I know. It's, very, it's obviously very secret. And this has, of course, been very much in the news lately. But you do need very high performance computing to do that. So these, are, these are, could all be considered the first computers, the first electronic computer. Uh, it was electronic, binary. Uh, it had a fixed program. Uh, this is a these are both reconstructions. As far as this was completely destroyed at the end of the war, one of these was saved. These were actually, many of these were actually built and many of them were built in the United States in Dayton, Ohio by uh, the National Cash Register Company, and that's an interesting story there. Uh, one of them survived and is now in a museum near the National Security Agency in Maryland, and I urge you all, if you ever get a chance to visit the United States, to go to that museum. It's open to the public, it's not classified, and they have the only remaining bomb uh, machine. But anyway, so why am I... Uh, not beginning the history of computing here. I'm going to begin it in the 1940s because what was happening, what is the computer all about? It's not just calculating, it's a convergence of different activities. Calculation, which is what I was talking about, that's one. But computers also store information. We saw that in this morning's lecture. Massive uh, cloud servers of, of uh, RAID uh, servers, of hard disks and so forth. Computers are also used for control, and this is part of my job at the Air and Space Museum, the way modern aircraft are flown by computer. Uh, the computers control hydroelectric power, they control power plants and so forth. Um, they control drones, things like that. And of course, they are automatic. They don't just do a calculation, they do a sequence of calculations automatically. So that's why I'm saying that the, the word computer, it's, an, it's a historical accident. It came from a project in the 1940s where a machine was built to replace human beings who were called computers. That was their, that was their job title. Their job was to carry out a simple arithmetic operations on pieces of paper and pass the results from one place to another uh, to carry out, a, uh, in this case, a, a solution of a differential equation. Those people were called computers and when the a machine was built, to speed up that process, they called it a computer. Not a calculator, but a computer. So that's uh, the combination is what I want to talk about. So let's start with calculation. Uh, Pascal, we all know as a philosopher, he also invented a device that could calculate uh, using the decimal system and the, the mechanical genius of Pascal, you don't think of him as a mechanical genius, but he, he figured out a way to what happens if you add one to 99999. Uh, how do you keep the mechanism from jamming? A brilliant invention that he came up with. Uh, Leibniz took it a step further. He figured out a way to multiply by uh, repeated addition. He invented a calculator. The other interesting thing, oh, by the way, uh, uh, the Curta was a mechanical handheld device, looked like a coffee grinder that was manufactured in Liechtenstein. Uh, 
And it was sold well into the 1970s. If you go on eBay, you can buy one, but they're very expensive now. But they were, they used the Leibniz wheel to multiply. And uh, the other interesting thing about Leibniz is that he, was, he wrote an analysis of binary arithmetic, but there was no connection, he made no connection between binary and calculating machinery. That doesn't come out until the 1940s, again, and it's really intertwined with electronics, which I'm going to get to. Uh, storage. How do you store information? Well, the standard histories, and I think they're largely correct, was a German immigrant named Hermann Hollerith, who conceived of an idea of storing information on holes in punched cards. And this was used in the 1890 U.S. Census, and uh, it, it could store data about individuals, which would then be tabulated, that is, just simple adding up and sorting, uh, no further calculation, really. But uh, that's, it was the, store, the way to store, once you stored that information on a card, uh, you could use it and reuse it in many, many different ways, a very versatile in in invention, which was used right into the 1980s. This is how I learned to program, by the way. I don't know if there's anybody else in the audience who uh, has that experience. <laughs> Quite an experience to use a key punch, I have to tell you. It was uh, something that uh, is good for the soul. <laughs> That's about all I can say. <laughs> anyway, so uh, that became the basis of a company called C uh, Computing, Tabulating, and Recording. The computing was actually not the, tab uh, it was not the punch card. That was a, a, a scale to measure uh, meat and how much you had to charge per pound of meat. Uh, the uh, recording was a time clock when you punch, uh, punched a clock when you went to work. He, uh, a man named Thomas Watson combined that and renamed it International Business Machines, IBM, in 1924. So the, the storage, that's where storage comes from. So uh, control, let's look at control. Control, automatic control, people say the, the earliest versions of that was in the James Watt steam engine, which had this uh, flyball governor, uh, which automatically adjusted the flow of steam to prevent the steam engine from running out of control, uh, speeding up too fast. As the, speed, as the steam engine sped up, the flyball would reduce the uh, amount of steam in a sort of negative feedback sort of way. By the way, governor, the word governor the, is, comes from the Greek, and it's the same word origin as cybernetics. So uh, an interesting, again, in the 1940s, largely during World War II, uh, ideas of automatic control were developed at a high degree of sophistication for anti-aircraft. A cam would be machined very carefully to reproduce a function, a complex aerodynamic function to, to aim the anti-aircraft gun. So what you have here is a, an equation in, the, in a mechanical form. This aspect of computing tends not to get much uh, due because it's what we now call analog. Uh, that analog digital distinction was not, didn't really exist back then. Uh, it, became, it came later, but it was certainly control, getting computers to do control was difficult uh, because in order for a digital computer to control other machinery, it has to operate in real time, as this device could do very simply. And that meant very high speeds, very sophisticated programming, and a very sophisticated input-output mechanism to take the output of a, uh, the, the numerical output of a digital computer and drive a machine of some kind, like a gun or an airplane or something else. So this is a, a neglected component, but very, very critical as well. So, uh, oops, I'm pointing the right way. I mentioned automatic operation. Here's another, uh, you know, as I say, if you go to Wikipedia, who invented the computer? They always mention Charles Babbage. Well, Babbage, uh, he never completed his analytical engine. Uh, I know he had a very sophisticated design. If it had been completed, it would have been a, a digital computer. 
Uh, he uh, cost a lot of money. He, he ran out of money. The British government stopped funding it. We will see very soon that the ele first electronic computers were very expensive as well, and there was a lot of skepticism about why spending so much money on them, which was eventually overcome. Uh, it was automatically programmed by punch cards that he uh, was inspired by Jacquard, uh, the French uh, designer of looms who could weave cloth according to patterns of punch card. And Jacquard uh, cloth is still manufactured today, very, a very exquisite fabric. Um, Augusta Ada, oops, I'm sorry, Augusta Ada, Countess of Lovelace, uh, wrote an account of the analytical engine. Uh, and she said, if it were to work, if we were, when we get it completed, here's how you can use it to do certain, to solve certain problems. She's been called the world's first programmer for that writing that she did. There's a lot of controversy about that, and I'm not going to get into that, wh whether or not she was, but she did understand something very fundamental to computing today, and that is a distinction between hardware and software, to use modern terms. They didn't have that term in those days. But if you back up here, there's no distinction between hardware and software here. This is the computer. This is the program, the CAM. She understood that you could have a different set of these Jacquard punch cards and get that machine to do different things, uh, unlimited in a way, just by your imagination, any, any equation. That was a key insight. I will give her credit for that, but I would not call her the world's first programmer. That's a little bit, um, it's, it's like people, I remember reading a book once by this management consultant that said Jesus was the first CEO. It's like, no, no, that's not right. It's, please. Anyway, um, so, okay, so uh, we're getting into the, closer to the 1940s. A final sort of piece of the puzzle was the, the theoretical basis for, for these machines which was established before any computers were actually built. And in the United States, every, or in the, in the English-speaking world, people talk about Boole or Boolean algebra. In fact, I believe that the, uh, David Hilbert doesn't get enough credit for, he's a famous mathematician, we all, uh, are, most of us are familiar with his work. Uh, he, he uh, tried to put, place mathematics on a fundamental ground of logic. This was also done in the, in the UK by uh, Whitehead and Russell. And uh, the standard history say, well, it was uh, proved false by Kurt Gödel and Alan Turing in the 1930s that uh, you can't do that. You can't really make uh, arithmetic. However, he did lay the foundation for the marriage of logic and arithmetic. And there's these famous stories where people say were math majors and they say, I was, a math, I was a mathematician and we never got anywhere near digits. The idea of calculating was just so, so low to, uh, that was what the engineers did. We didn't calculate, we just did pure math. And uh, you had to break that distinction down. And this is still a very interesting question about how do you know an answer is right when a computer, a calculator gives you an answer. I would like to give credit to Konrad Zuse, the German aer aerodynamics engineer who wrote a, thesis, a doctoral thesis which was never published because of the war, but actually was in the 19, late 1930s where he showed the, uh, the, base, the logical basis using Hilbert's uh, logic for calculating. This was also done in the United States by a man named Claude Shannon who worked at Bell Labs. And uh, it's a simultaneous discovery. So I, a marriage of logic and arithmetic. So we still call the central processor of a computer a logic, a logical device. And it, but it also, it also does calculation, which uh, we take that for granted. But I have to, trust me, they, they didn't see that in the 1930s, that's for sure. So, um, I talked about the, the analog digital convergence. Uh, here again, I, I apologize if I tend to be American centric, but I believe this is where a lot of the ideas came from. Uh, the, uh, a physics professor in Iowa uh, recognized this distinction. He built a machine which was never completed. 
uh, that would um, compute in discrete components. He didn't call it digital, but he said this is not an analog computer. So that's where the term analog comes from. George Stibitz, that's this man here, is credited with the coining of the term digital. And it's an ironic uh, thing because we have 10 digits on our hands, but uh, there's no binary, computers use binary. So uh, a little bit confused, but he called it digital stuck. Uh, there were other use, terms that they were using that didn't quite fit, but uh, he also built a device at Bell Laboratories that uh, calculated, uh, did complex number arithmetic, very simple addition and multiplication of complex numbers. Uh, Depends on whether you think that's hard to do or not. Uh, and he also demonstrated it remotely. So that's the first example of remote access to a computer in 1941 using a teletype. Uh, and the teletype was located at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire and the computer was at Bell Laboratories in uh, Lower Manhattan. So uh, interesting guy, uh, Stibitz at Bell Labs. So you have all these, all these things going on. Now, Notice what's going on here. This is credited as possibly the first electronic device. Stibitz was using telephone relays. He worked at Bell Labs. He had the whole uh, infrastructure of Bell Labs uh, telephone relays available to him. And uh, Adonazov realized that if you really want to do uh, a complex sequence of operations, you need high speed. You need vacuum tubes. You need electronics. And that is a sort of engineering aspect of computers from the bottom up. If the logic of the Hilbert and uh, Turing logic is coming from the top down, you need electronics. You can build a computer out of mechanical devices. And uh, there was a lot of skepticism. Zusa himself was uh, skeptical. He built a computer out of telephone relays in Berlin that was operational in 1941. It was destroyed uh, in a bombing raid in 1945. Howard Aiken uh, was a Harvard professor who built a mechanical computer using IBM equipment at Harvard University. It was operational in 1944. And he was also very skeptical about electronics because in those days, vacuum tubes would burn out very quick. They didn't have a very long lifetime. Uh, what, uh, uh, of course, we now have solid state, but uh, they were fragile. And uh, Aiken actually is the person, you've probably heard this story about someone said that there only five computers would satisfy the whole world's needs. It probably came from this man. Now, I, I published that and I immediately got a, a tremendous reaction. How dare you uh, disparage Aiken? He was a brilliant inventor and he, you know, well, I, didn't, I don't mean to disparage. He was thinking of the computer like we would think of an astronomical telescope, like, the, like these ones in Chile, or a cyclotron, like the one in Geneva at CERN. How many big cyclotrons do you need in the world? Well, you need a few. You don't need one on every, in everybody's hand. Uh, maybe it'd be nice if you could have one in everybody's hand. But, uh, that was the, the mentality, what he thought. He also realized at the time, and this is a fact, that if you had a computer, you needed an army of mathematicians to write the programming for it. Where do you get all those mathematicians from? There simply weren't enough. So he did not foresee uh, a lot of things, including the development of high-level programming languages which solved that second problem, but he also didn't see that if you could get a vacuum tube computer to operate for an hour, it would so do more work than a relay computer could in a week, just because of the speed difference. So uh, there were uh, people at IBM said, well, why build an electronic computer? Why not take our tabulating equipment and modify it? And they did that, in fact, and uh, it worked. And it worked quite well at a time when the early computers were not uh, very reliable. So here we go. We begin here. A computer built in 1945 at the University of Pennsylvania. The electronic numeric integrator and computer. It was programmed by plugging in wires. In, in effect, you rewired the, the computer each time. It uh, was programmed by women who were not named at the time, although we have, historians have since identified them. And uh, fortunately, they were, we've been able to interview some of them before they passed away. Uh, so that's a great story there. 
uh, the, so the, the computer has not only many fathers, but many mothers, and here they are right here. Uh, the ENIAC was built to solve um, differential equations, and it was also used um, uh, to, look, to uh, look for prime numbers. It was also used to design um, a hydrogen bomb, which uh, is also done at Oak Ridge National Laboratory with supercomputers. Um, so it had a general purpose capability, even though it was built for a specific purpose, if you could program it. And that was another key breakthrough. So here's where we begin. At the University of Pennsylvania, with a giant machine with 18,000 vacuum tubes, that, yes, it did have some reliability issues, but if you keep it running for a few hours, eventually they got it to be very reliable. And it did, it did a lot of work, it worked right into the 1950s. A bit of a bear to program, as you can imagine, but uh, it worked. So that's where I would like to begin uh, the history. The other interesting thing about this computer, if it were just a one-off, we would forget it, but uh, some, something very interesting happened during its construction. Uh, a, a Hungarian refugee named John von Neumann uh, by chance learned of this project, uh, which was being led by a, graduate, a recent graduate, e Presper Eckert and John Mockley, a physics professor, and he joined the team. And they, they were building this machine. The wartime was raging. They had a tremendous uh, deadlines to meet and so forth. But they all three got together during the construction and say, okay, we're building this computer. What would, a, what would the next computer look like if we had a chance to build the next one? And they, decided, they came up with a notion called the EDVAC, electronic discrete variable, that means digital, automatic computer. Von Neumann wrote a report in 1945, which was supposed to have been classified, but uh, one of his assistants mimeographed it and circulated it. In it, he said, this is what a computer should look like. This is what this machine is going to look like. That is the basis for the computer architecture until we get to these multi-cores that we were talking about this morning. The Von Neumann architecture. Uh, the, about 100 copies were mimeographed on very, I don't know what the, if the Portuguese have a word for mimeograph, it's this uh, reproduction system on very sensitive paper. They didn't have Xerox machines in those days. And um, polygraph, okay. Uh, I, could, I could just tell you a story, uh, you probably wonder what does a curator do at the Smithsonian. I got a call one day from, the, from a government agency saying, we're clearing out our library. Would you come and take a look and see if there's anything interesting? One of these copies was in there. Probably the, the Magna Carta of computing. And I, I, I completely, ah, you know, my God, I found, you know. So I took it home, put it in my basement. And that was a bad idea because you never, ever, ever store valuable papers in your basement, never. So it is now safely stored at the Smithsonian Rare Book Library. So there are uh, maybe 10 copies left in existence. It's been reprinted. You can go online and get it. It's not the easiest thing to read. But uh, the basis of the von Neumann architecture, which is where we begin computing, is this notion of a separation of a processor, a memory. In von Neumann's day, there would be a single channel between the two, which we call the von Neumann bottleneck which is what these uh, people at NVIDIA are breaking through with g uh, game chips. And uh, the other interesting thing about it is that the program, the instructions are stored in the same place as the data. There is no distinction between the two. And there are lots of engineering practical reasons for that. Uh, if you have a memory device, it's expensive you don't really want to have the luxury of trying to separate the two, even though that creates some potential problems. But it also means that in some kind of fundamental sense, and this goes back to Alan Turing, there is no difference between program and data. That, they, that logically they're the same. They're binary bits that can be manipulated in various ways. So this is where we begin, 1945 with the EDVAC report. Uh, I had a long prologue, but uh, I felt it was necessary. How am I doing on time here? Okay. <laughs>
So we have what's sometimes called the generations of computing, beginning with the, as I say, the, the report was um, widely circulated, copies got to England, uh, where uh, an Englishman named Maurice Wilkes built uh, a, a machine in Cambridge called the EDSAC, uh, an electronic delay storage automatic computer regarded sometimes as the world's first sort of practical electronic stored program computer. Uh, there was one built in Israel. There was one built at Oak Ridge. A lot of them. They're called von Neumann machines. And um, they also became commercialized. And it became relatively easy. Uh, there, there was a lot of publicity at the time about this new device and how incredible it was. A lot of companies wanted to get involved. A company in Minnesota came up with a way of storing data on a drum. Notice the von Neumann architecture here, input, output, there it is. Uh, notice the binary arithmetic, notice the control aspect. Uh, these, uh, this company was founded by people who helped break Japanese codes during World War II uh, with mechanical devices. So they made this uh, memory device uh, for, uh, available for sale so you could buy the, the drum, put some electronics together, and bingo, you're in the computer business. And as far as input-output, you would use something called a flexo writer, a, a typewriter that had a paper tape punch connected to it. So it was relatively easy to get into the computer business. These were not very powerful computers, but they sort of bootstrapped everyone into the, into the computer business. A lot of these kinds of things were also done in continental Europe as well. So here we are beginning with so-called the first generation. The vacuum tubes obviously is a limit. And again, this is talking about the calculating uh, aspect of computing. What about data storage? Let's get back to IBM. IBM had an, uh, would sell, and they very popular in Europe as well. A suite of, of machines, a key punch where you punch data into cards. You could sort, uh, you could duplicate, collate, and interpret. So you, you would have a room full of these machines and you would have decks of cards and you would have people carrying the deck, the decks from one place to another. In a sense, the computer replaced that room with that person being the program, okay? That was how IBM, that was IBM's business right into the 1960s. But data storage was very difficult. And even into the 1970s, uh, oops, I'm sorry, uh, Remington Rand, uh, which built electronic computers, was using cards. Uh, these are cards where you would uh, cut out notches in the edge and use a knitting needle to sort things. Those were used into the 1970s as well because data processing was very difficult. Calculating was a sense, the, the first thing they did, but data processing, storage and retrieval of data was much more difficult. And uh, IBM uh, got into the computer business, but they, they, um, they never, they kept pushing this for small businesses uh, quite, quite a long time into the 1970s. Uh, IBM, though, eventually got into the big computer iron business, what I call the second generation, now using transistors. Uh, and the, this use of, for a primitive integrated circuit. And notice, notice all the tapes. And uh, tape was a sort of a defining characteristic of what computers were like in those days. Tapes are sequential. Mechanisms. In other words, if you want a piece of data, you have to wind the tape until you find it. You can't go directly to it. And this is a fundamental property of tape which really fundamentally stamped the whole data processing business. No matter how fast your processor was, you were limited by the tape. Now, you, there are, somewhere in the back there, there are disk hard disk drives, and I'll talk about them later. But this was what the mainframe computing looked like. I really like this picture here, and I don't know how many of you are computer science majors, but IBM came up with a transistorized device called the 7090 in 1960. Then they decided to upgrade it by adding index registers, which is a way of stepping through memory 
more efficiently. So they call it the 7094, and there they are. One, two, three, four. Just bolted on top. Four index registers. Of course, you, you have these all these lights. You could see where every bit was. Wonderful d device. I, I learned to program on one of these. Um, so this, this is IBM. Uh, they, they came up with uh, the system 360 meant that one machine could be equally suitable for business and science. Uh, NASA used both of these for the space program to put people on the moon, but it was also a workhorse for businesses as well. And they had a whole line of computers from, from uh, relatively small to very, very large, including a supercomputer, which didn't really work very well, but it did work. So in the middle of all this, and this is one of the things that von Neumann really didn't understand, perhaps because he was so smart, I guess, that he thought that the programming would be trivial. And getting back to what Howard Aiken said, there aren't enough mathematicians in the world. What, what good is having a computer if you can't program it? And along came this realization that you could get a computer itself to uh, do its own programming if you could create a program called a compiler which would accept instructions in Fortran. We had Fortran mentioned this morning, uh, 1957. That's a pretty long-lived uh, program, don't you think? Um, Grace Hopper worked f with Howard Aiken at Harvard. She also worked uh, with Eckert and Mockley. She came up with this notion of a compiler that you pile up subroutines in a deck of cards, put it on a tape, and then you you only have to call the subroutines. Uh, Fortran, actually, you wrote the la in algebraic language. Uh, COBOL, common-oriented, bu common business-oriented language for business process, still in use today. And here's where this is an interesting story. The Europeans uh, looked at the United States and IBM with horror in their eyes. It's like, oh my God, these are horribly, poorly designed programming. IBM is such a monster. Uh, we've got to do something. They came up with a language called Algol 60, algorithmic language. It's also the name of a star in Arabic called the ghoul. <laughs> uh, somewhat, uh, uh, anyway, so uh, anyway, um, it was much more formal, uh, rigorous, and uh, had a lot of advantages, for example, recursion that Fortran did not have. Um, it caught on for a while, but uh, faded away. They tried to upgrade it to Algol 68, but that was a disaster, it didn't work. Uh, out of that, a man named Nicholas Wirth from uh, uh, Switzerland came up with a language called Pascal, which is a modern, it's still in use today. Out of that came this notion that programming had to be put on a more formal basis, uh, a man, Edgar Dijkstra, was very vociferous and he was very critical of IBM, as you might imagine. He wrote a very controversial paper called Go To Considered Harmful, that these, uh, these codes were written with like spaghetti where you go here, go there, go, and, and uh, uh, that was a big kerfluffle that didn't last very long. Meanwhile, database software was getting better and better, the creation of database management systems that broke through that problem of uh, storage and retrieval of large amounts of data. Eventually, you get a language called C, and that came much later, and I'm gonna talk about that probably this afternoon. We'll see. So, um, IBM really dominated the history of computing. In fact, uh, when, I, when I, uh, I wrote my first book about the history of computing, I, had, uh, I was talking about all different things, and I sent it to a, a referee, and he said, uh, there's not enough IBM in here. <laughs> and he gets like, okay. But uh, believe me, there was plenty. Um, IBM dominated the industry, 70% of, of all mainframe installations. In 1968, under pressure from the federal government, they unbundled their software. In other words, when you bought an IBM or leased an IBM computer, before 1968, the software came free. Their IBM engineers would, would develop your software. They were forced to unbundle, that's the term, unbundle, and that gave rise to a separate industry of, um, of software, which today is huge, as you can imagine. Uh, they were also sued for antitrust by the federal government. And it's very interesting, 
in the 1970s, they spent a tremendous amount of time in court. Their lawyers with vol volumes and volumes of documentation, a uh, huge uh, trial in a, in a building in lower Manhattan that had lousy air conditioning. Uh, it was uh, year after year, it dragged on. One, person, one expert got up to testify and he said, it is most unlikely that any major new venture into the general purpose computer industry can be expected. I think he got that wrong. <laughs> but that's how powerful IBM was. And he was referring to this mainframe data processing culture, the same year that the Apple II was, in, was uh, announced. So uh, I guess if there's a lesson and I, uh, for the rest of the week, it's like things change. Things can change very rapidly. And uh, just because something is happening now doesn't mean it's going to keep going. And I think that's the lesson to be learned from this antitrust trial, if there's any. So um, we're moving along. I mentioned the IBM 7090 as a transistor machine, the discrete transistor. And what it was, they had a, they had a vacuum tube computer called the 709. And the Air Force, uh, US Air Force, was building a network of um, radar stations near the Arctic Circle to uh, detect Soviet aircraft coming over the North Pole. And they needed a computer to, or computers to manage that. They went to IBM, I said, yes, we'll give you a computer, but the Air Force said, no, we need a computer that uses transistors, not vacuum tubes, because transistors were then coming online. So IBM said, okay, we're going to upgrade our 7090 into a transistorized computer, our 709, into a transistorized computer, and we'll deliver it. They ended up sending about 200 IBM engineers to Greenland to finish the design, okay? That's how IBM committed themselves to business. That's why they became so dominant. So it was, a, it was in a sense a horseless carriage. It was a transistorized version of a vacuum tube computer. At MIT in Cambridge, some people thought, what if we look at the transistor not as a replacement for a tube, but as a device in itself? What can you do with it? And they came up with a notion of something called the mini computer, which is a little bit deceptive in the name. I think it was named after the mini skirt that girls were wearing at the time. But they said, let's build a computer that's fast, using these uh, so-called surface barrier transistors, um, with a very innovative architecture, short word length, uh, different addressing modes to get around the addressing. And the other, uh, they used this machine called a wire wrap machine that automatically wired the back plane. You can see the complexity of the back, back plane here. And we saw that this morning, didn't we? With the complexity of the wiring, which apparently was being done by human beings, not machines. Um, they came up with something called the PDP-8. And the other interesting thing, this was a very small company. They said, let the customer do the, do the customization. Give them all the information and let them do the software. Let them develop everything. We don't have the resources, the so-called OEM, original equipment manufacturer phenomenon, which is sort of the basis of what uh, the PC world is like today. Uh, Apple, does, Apple writes some software, but it's all the apps that, that you use. Okay, so this was so, uh, concentrated in the Boston region, so-called Route 128, a number of companies taking advantage of the transistor, and it was uh, before Silicon Valley. This was the center of innovative computing in lots of ways, and I'm going to really talk about this um, in the second half. But let's talk again about solid state. This is the graph that Gordon Moore published in 1965 uh, about the density of circuits on a piece of silicon. Notice that uh, the log of the base two, uh, there were, uh, you know, two to, two to the, you know, 60, 120 circuits on a chip, not, not really a whole lot. He projected that they would double every year. That later flattened out to every 18 months. And it's called Moore's Law. But notice how crude the graph was. Notice it begins in 1959 with the invention of the integrated circuit. He was at a place called Fairchild Semiconductor, where it was invented in Silicon Valley. What now it's called Silicon Valley. It wasn't then. It was still uh, orchards, prune orchards, and, and beautiful valley, uh, valley of heart's delight. 
is what it was called. Uh, but that's where Fairchild was located. Uh, of course, it's, it went on. Um, I think it's safe to say that the rest of this week is all devoted to how to address the question of what do we do after Moore's Law. Uh, it seems to have come to an end uh, in some ways, although it's, things are still moving. But uh, the original idea, kind of the, the idea of putting circuits on silicon, uh, is pushing the limits pretty much. I'm going to talk about this other graph. It's hard, a little bit hard to read. This is a graph published later on where someone talks about the, de the relationship of laboratory research. This is Moore's Law here. And then eventually the product gets into a co co commercial product. What's so important about this graph here is this line from 1948 to 1959 is zero. The slope is zero. In other words, there's one transistor on a piece of material from 19, for more than 10 years, the density of circuits was, was one. One device on a slab of originally germanium and then silica. And I think that, I'm, not, I'm a historian, I don't really know about the future of computing, but this is where we are today with quantum computing, neuro, neurologic, all the things that we're going to talk about later. We are at the stage where we are trying to figure out what to do. And we are figuring out what to do. Eventually, and I don't know when, I assume it will happen, it's going gonna, it's gonna to click. And then, boom, it takes off. Uh, that hasn't happened yet. You know, how, where do we have, how many bits does a quantum computer do right now? We, you know, that sort of thing. We're down here. But that's not to say nothing is happening. We're going to find that out later in the week. A lot is happening. And what was happening in the 1950s? A lot was happening. Uh, you switch from germanium to silicon. They're both on the, table, uh, the left hand column of the periodic table. Silicon has a lot of properties which lend themselves to density that germanium didn't have. The first transistors were made out of germanium. Uh, a process of pulling the crystal silicon out of a melt that was developed at Bell Laboratories to get these uh, wafers which you then slice into wafers. Uh, the zone refine, you pass a high temperature t uh, uh, coil and it carries the impurities through and you get them out the other end. So you have very high purified silicon. Photolithography, that's how you miniaturize everything. And this was a very difficult thing to do. It was borrowed from the photography industry, but it had to um, really advance. And of course, as you get to smaller and smaller densities, you have issues of the uh, uh, the, what we call color aberration or the, the difficulties of lenses. That had to all be solved, uh, eventually moving to uh, x-rays and so forth. All of that had to be done. Uh, that's what was going on while the slope is zero. A lot of that was happening at Bell Laboratories, uh, a place called Texas Instruments in Dallas, Texas. So things were happening. And uh, that I think maybe, this may be the most most important slide of the entire, my entire talk here is that as you sort of keep this in mind um, for the rest of the week. So uh, here we are in Silicon Valley now. Fairchild Camera and Instrument is located in a place called Mountain View, California. And um, the whole valley really was started, well, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead here. The whole valley was still started by a group of engineers who worked for William Shockley, one of the inventors of the transistor at Bell Labs. And uh, Shockley moved to uh, the Palo Alto area. Uh, there's interesting reasons why he chose that. That area had a very advanced electronics uh, local electronics industry uh, coming out of World War II of radar, microwave technology, not computers, but there was still a lot going on there. And he was apparently a brilliant man, but a terrible, terrible manager. 
And there's all kinds of horror stories about him accusing someone of stealing a typewriter or something. I don't know, crazy stuff. Anyway, eight people resigned en masse and joined Fairchild, the so-called traitorous eight. That's Robert Noyce right there in the front. Fairchild was a camera company. They, um, uh, they made uh, primary aerial photography cameras. Uh, Sherman Fairchild was an early investor in IBM. Uh, he had a lot of money. Uh, he enticed these people, or they, they went to him and said, give us the money and we'll start a, a semiconductor company, which they did. Uh, and then, here's the Silicon Valley phenomenon. They left Fairchild and founded Intel, which is still around. Fairchild is still around, but it doesn't really do much. So, uh, this is the Silicon Valley way. You leave a company and start a, a startup, and, you, and the money was relatively easy to get if you had a good business plan. So uh, they eventually come out with a, Intel's product, but I'm going to back up here. They come out with an integrated circuit. Now here's a, a case of a simultaneous invention of uh, te uh, Texas Instruments in 1959. This is made out of germanium, by the way, uh, but it worked. It was an oscillator, a whole circuit. Noyce, of course, was at Fairchild. Here's his patent. And uh, I'm going to back up a little bit. Did I, did I get the... Uh, no, I guess I, I didn't. Well, anyway, there's his patent. It used a, a... The interesting thing here is that the entire device is on a flat plane, the so-called planar process. That's really what makes uh, Moore's Law happen, that you can... You can uh, insulate the various devices from one another by an oxide of silicon, which uh, prevents a short circuit from one to the other. And there's his patent. So uh, here we go. Finally, that slope starts to move up. Uh, one of their first products, uh, 1,000 bits of RAM, and it's the end of magnetic core as a memory device. So now things are starting to happen fast, right? Let's see where we are now. So, um, we have this Silicon Valley phenomenon. There's a uh, competition with Route 128, uh, Texas Instruments. Texas Instruments was a geophysical exploration company that would... Uh, set off explosions in the ground. The shock waves would bounce off layers of geology, come back, and they would do a Fourier analysis to uh, see if where the oil, if there were places where oil might be trapped. So that's, they got into the electronics business that way. Very interesting uh, sort of back door in Dallas. Um, Fairchild, I mentioned, uh, Route 128 was primarily MIT graduates. So uh, IBM, was still in the business, very much so, uh, headquartered in New York City and with their facilities. And they were making a very difficult transition away from, from punch cards uh, to pure electronics. But they also came up with a, uh, an invention which uh, happened in just south of Silicon Valley, uh, San Jose, the hard disk. And... Uh, they demonstrated it at the Brussels World's Fair in 1957. And it, they called it the RAMAC, Random Access uh, Accounting, Random Access Mechanical Accounting Computer, I think is what it's, anyway, RAMAC, Professor RAMAC, they called it. And you could go up to it at the World's Fair and ask a question, and it would give you an answer in different languages. And the president of IBM, Watson Jr., the son of the founder, so this is the biggest moment in IBM's history. He was more right than he realized because with the advent of random access memory and a hard disk, you, uh, you sort of saw the beginning of the end of that mainframe culture. You combine that with the mini computer coming out of Boston, things getting smaller and cheaper, and uh, uh, the mainframe era, which of course is still with us, um, is... Uh, is about to not end, but sort of become a niche along with other things, including the personal computer. So um, 
I, I was going to end here, but maybe we can keep going. It depends on people. Let me just go to the last slide of part one here. Um, if you were an engineer at the time, you had a piece of semi-log graph paper on your desk, and you plotted out the density of chips over with x-axis being time, density on the y-axis, the logarithm of density on the y-axis. And you realize that around 1970 or so, 1971 or so, there would be enough circuits on a piece of silicon that would equal the number of vacuum tubes in the UNIVAC, which was one of the world's first commercial computers. That's Grace Hopper, by the way, showing how to program a UNIVAC. So here you were, all over the United States and probably Europe as well, with this piece of graph paper in your hand saying, okay, we are going to now have a computer on a chip. Easy to say, but hard to do. Um, I have deliberately not put a lot of uh, websites on the slides, but if there is one that I highly recommend, Gordon Bell was the architect of the PDP-8 uh, mini computer, also later the PDP-10 and the VAX, and I'll get to the VAX in a minute. He is, I consider, the master of semi-log graph paper. <laughs> he has plotted out these trends over and over again, predicting correctly what was happening. Uh, one of the things that he showed, for example, was Raspberry Pi, a computer for $35 that you can hold in your hand that pretty much does everything, that you, a general purpose computer, can, or Arduino. Uh, and uh, what does that mean for, for a, uh, uh, a manufacturer of large computers? We had uh, this morning lecture, the, the revolt, or the, the attack of the killer micros. So I, I, uh, Gordon is, is quite a character. He, uh, he left Digital Equipment Corporation and uh, ended up um, chronicling his life online in uh, co uh, constantly streaming everything into uh, a database. Uh, so I guess I could end part one. I think we could take questions, and depending on the time, I could start in on part two because I got plenty to do. Does anybody want to ask any questions? Go ahead. No, no questions? I, no I, qu I do have yes. one comment yes. and perhaps a challenge. Yes. Okay. The first comment is, I think I have an idea of a computer which is much older than anything you've talked about. Yes. It's your hand. When a, a kid starts to learn math, yes. he counts with his fingers. Yes, digital. There's control. There's memory. <laughs> There's yes. all the ingredients of a computer with the in brain. your hand. Well, with the brain. Yeah, the brain too, <laughs> yes. but the hand is also yes. important. Digital. Well, that's where digital comes from. Yes. And the I.O., yes. Well, yes. So, you, as I said, it begins with the Homo sapiens. Yes, absolutely. So, perhaps that's <laughs> your first computer uh, for, for, for history. And the second thing I had to say is a challenge. Yes. Um, is... Um, Try to understand what the history of computers can teach us yes. about the future of computers. Because someone says, I, I will paraphrase it, that the person who doesn't understand history is cursed to repeat it itself. Well, I, I mentioned uh, Digital Equipment Corporation is gone. You know, uh, they invented all of all of pretty much all of this modern uh, uh, PC world, uh, but they're gone. IBM is still around and they're very much in business, but they're no longer the dominant company that they used to be. So, uh, and, and many of these other companies that were competing with IBM, uh, Burroughs, Honeywell, Univac, Sperry Rand, um, uh, Ray, uh, they're, they're all gone, RCA, most of them are gone. So uh, uh, IBM has managed to survive just barely. Uh, Fairchild has run into trouble. So. Um, uh, the second half of this talk, I'm going to talk about all the, the other companies uh, um, like MySpace, you know, like the modern version that, that disappear, uh, GeoCities or even Yahoo is in trouble. So uh, um, that's a lesson. You have to be agile. You know, Kodak invented the digital camera, but they went bankrupt because they couldn't commercialize it. Uh, Xerox, 
invented so much of modern computing, but they no longer are an independent company. So uh, that's a lesson. That's number one lesson is to be agile. The number two lesson is that graph that you need some fundamental research, which in this era was primarily conducted at Bell Laboratories in New Jersey. Because they were a regulated monopoly of the telephone company, they uh, had the freedom to spend money on things that uh, they didn't have to worry about bringing it to market right away, such as um, the Unix operating system, which they, the, the transistor, which they invented, but then gave, pretty much gave away for a modest fee the licensing rights to the transistor. So uh, the real question that we should be asking is where is the modern version of Bell Labs? Now, Google and Apple both have very large research organizations, as does Microsoft. But I've talked to some of these people, including Gordon Moore, who said, Silicon Valley, you know, there's R&D. Silicon Valley is all about D, development. They are very good at taking an idea and making a commercial product out of it. They don't do R. They don't do the fundamental research that we may be hearing about later this week. That doesn't happen in Silicon Valley. At least that's according to Gordon Moore. Um, where does, who has the luxury, especially if you're a publicly traded company, to do that kind of research? Now, obviously, universities... Universities have to do it. Well, where, does the, where do the universities get the resources to do that? Uh, in the United States, and we saw this this morning, there, there have been subsidies by the Defense Department. For example, um, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, uh, it was a euphemism that she used, what she called non-commercial, I forget what the euphemism was. Does anybody remember? Non-civilian, non yes. What that means is Defense Department money. And uh, uh, what if the Defense Department decides they don't want to fund these, which is actually happening right, uh, a lot. Um, where does that come, where, where does the money come from? So um, I think we are in a very interesting period right now, but I can't speak uh, as an expert about the current state of things, that um, we, we need that fundamental research and we also really need uh, to, to go down a dead end because there were lots of dead ends. There were lots of dead ends uh, trying to get the transistor to work. The early transistors were just terrible. In fact, you didn't even know uh, what kind of performance you got until after you bought the transistor and tested it, then you realized how much gain you had because the manufacturer had no control or very poor control over how, how to make those things. And... Uh, um, we, we're, we need to kind of realize, you know, there's this sort of mantra in Silicon Valley to fail, fail fast or fail forward. I think that's a marketing hype. I don't really believe that they, I don't think they really believe it themselves, personally. But uh, that's what they talk about. But the reality is that failure actually can be a real serious thing. But if you do it right, you get a success that comes out of it, like the Unix operating system, uh, like the integrated circuit. Uh, there were many other uh, competitors to the integrated circuit, which I didn't really talk about. Um, there was this idea that IBM used of depositing circuits on a piece of ceramic. There was this other uh, notion of uh, um, building up molecules that would switch. Well, this is what we're, we're going to get later in the week. But they thought, oh, this was in the 1960s they were going to do that. So uh, that didn't work either. And money was poured into this, a lot of money. There was this uh, notion of, um, which actually was used in those early supercomputers, of what they call cord wood, where you stack things very tightly together, like wood, stacks of firewood. Uh, that didn't go any, anywhere either. So uh, failure um, is something that happens if, it's, if you fail in the right way, and I, what is the right way? I don't know. I don't know. How would I know? If, uh, yes, sir? Well, I've got a couple of questions. Yeah. 
So, uh, so uh, I've got a couple of questions. So uh, one is related with what you've just said. So uh, you talked about a lot about innovation and a lot about invention. And uh, throughout your presentation, I think you probably mentioned one university, just one. Uh, meaning that a lot of these things that you were talking about. Yes. Well, University of Pennsylvania. Yes. Uh, so um, where, I mean, I'm sure that a lot of the things that ended up in companies, as you mentioned, yes. somehow started in some research lab in some obscure, potentially obscure university, right? So, but I, I don't feel from your presentation that contribution from the universities. That's uh, a good point, yes. Uh, so, so what were the people well, uh, you know, at the university level that were also making progress by, by injecting people in the market? Like what were the uh, forces driving all this innovation, if there were? Well, uh, that's a very good point. The University of Pennsylvania, the innovation, they, they got a contract with the U.S. Army. So the Army gave them the money uh, to build this machine. They had some talented electrical engineers on the staff. Uh, they had an inspiration for how to build it. But yes, you're, you're correct. Um, I would say the University of Göttingen in Germany, where Hilbert taught, uh, very, very far away from the practical construction of a computer, but the fundamental logic that, that uh, mathematics that Hilbert created with that school uh, has a repercussion down to the present day. I mentioned MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which also had a number of military contracts, which it, it brings up this whole issue about military funding in the United States and how it drove so much of this, and how, what, is the, what is the implication today of the relationship of the U.S. military? I don't want to get into that because it's too complicated, but uh, with, without that kind of, of, um, of avenue, and we're going to talk second half about ARPA, Advanced Research Projects Agency, the ARPANET, uh, without that, what's going to happen? Bell Labs was an exception. It was almost like a university, uh, that they didn't have to worry so much about the profits. But I would say that the fundamental research about the properties of silicon and germanium were done at universities, including European universities in Switzerland and Germany, and also at Purdue University in the United States. So there was some of that. Um, I'm just trying to think of other places where this might have happened, but it's really kind of deep down, it's there but the actual creation of products or devices came out of industries with government, with military funding. So, so, so the other related question, I mean, I think you kind of already answered that, but there, for some of these things to happen, there has to be an ecosystem, right? When you, when you, an ecosystem that actually provides other tools, not necessarily the ones that yes. end up, you know, being produced, but uh, if the, the process, like the, the lithography process or, or the, the, the process that involves some photographic technology, you yes. have to have an industry yes. already in place, which is not a computing industry, yeah, yes. it's not related with computers, That's right. but it gives you the tools for building yes. those things. So uh, where is the place that, where that can happen now? where you have such a variety of tools yes. that for building another a completely different type of computer, you'll have the tools there. Now, even if you don't have the plan for the computer, you'll have the tools for when you have yes. the plan. Well, that's the, certainly the, the history of Silicon Valley, that they had a lot of expertise in microwave electronics for radar. And radar technology was also very important for the first computer in the UK, the EDSAC at Cambridge University, uh, Maurice Wilkes, got his, uh, was a, uh, a mathematician who learned about radar technology. Uh, Shockley worked on radar in World War II. So uh, uh, there, is that, uh, there is that need for the infrastructure of machine tooling, uh, of uh, electronics, of microwave high frequency electronics, uh, pure mathematics, uh, which is, has to be there in some form or another but the translation of that into products is a very, very mysterious process. And I think uh, I, I can talk about it uh, in the second half if we, or, or I can go in further now if you want to keep going with it. I don't know. How do people feel? Any more questions or anything like that?
I think we can go for a coffee and we can use the coffee to discuss many of these ideas okay. and continue afterwards in your second part and then we'll have another period of okay, questions fine. and we can... Any other final, final words about part one? Okay. No? So, okay. we'll gather around. Okay, we, we have one question, one question there, sorry, sorry. So I had kind of two parts. One was you mentioned that in Silicon Valley, the, um, the notion that it's more development than research. And I can't help to think about kind of the origins of some of the great research institutions in Silicon Valley, whether it be the creation of NACA. Uh, yes. There's Stanford, of course. Right. You've got UC Berkeley to the south, Pasadena yes. with Caltech and all that. But um, that's not really my question. That was just a thought. My question goes back to the one the most important thing you noted of your whole presentation was which was this one graph with the Moore's Law. Yes. And it's, it seems to me it's a very, it's an often hyped term, you know, everything's on a Moore's Law ex extrapolation, but right. perhaps that's not necessarily true for rocketry, for example, but it's true for microelectronics. Could you talk about how the differentiation between how Moore's Law has tracked in the past and where it's going up to today and where, how it detracts from the hype, so to speak? Well, uh, a lot of, a lot of in inventions per uh, proceed at uh, exponential rates. Like if you look at the automobile after Henry Ford uh, develops the assembly line or the telephone, they do uh, spread very rapidly. Nothing quite as, as long and sustained as Moore's Law. But uh, one of the reasons is that Moore's Law deals with information, which is a sort of weightless uh, entity. Uh, there are some fundamental issues of any kind of machine that requires a human being that we can't shrink human beings. Therefore, automobiles and airplanes and railroads and all of those things ha have a certain size limitation to them and a certain physicality which uh, electronics uh, has been uh, miraculously immune to until recently. And we, we now know that the real dry, uh, stumbling block, one of the biggest stumbling blocks of electronics is the energy required to cool the circuits and also just the, the, en the energy density of these chips. They get very hot and uh, uh, we've, we've reached this. So uh, it's taken a long, long time for that to happen but meanwhile, you know, obviously, if we could shrink human beings, uh, we'd solve a lot of our ecological problems. We could all live like ants or something I like that. I think there's a movie coming out okay. right about that. So we can't do that. I mean, this is a, oh, well, I'm going to, you know, this is very interesting because what's the big ha thing happening in aviation today is drones. And drones are very, they can be very small. They can be as small as a, a hummingbird. And what can you do once you take the human being out of an airplane? Oh my God, there's all kinds of stuff going on, which is uh, thanks to the integration of microelectronics into flying machines. So uh, Moore's Law, uh, it's very important. It, real, it is real, it has been real. And uh, how it's gonna continue now, I don't know. But um, it, it has parallels with other uh, advances in technology like electrification, telephones and automobiles and airplanes, but it's also in some ways unique because of that, uh, uh, because of that sort of ineffable quality of electronics that they, that bits don't weigh anything. At least they didn't until recently. Okay, thank you very much once again. We'll convey in about half an hour, so please enjoy uh, uh, the coffee break. Let's thank the speaker again.